Welcome to Washington Watch. My name is Joseph Backholm, and I am sitting in for Tony today. We are so glad that you are with us. As a reminder, you can always find this program at TonyPerkins.com. If you miss the show, you can always catch it later, TonyPerkins.com. Also encourage you to download the Stand Firm app on the Google on the Play Store, or at the iTunes Store, wherever you get your apps. Today on the program, we're going to discuss a State Department report on international religious freedom, why it matters to you and everyone. We'll talk to Travis Weber about that. We're also going to talk to a worship leader who has been leading the Let Us Worship movement around the country in response to government lockdowns on church, what kind of reaction has he been getting from both the public as well as governments? We'll talk about that a little later in the program. We'll finish today talking about how to think biblically about cancel culture. We all have heard of it. What does it mean? Should we be canceling people or not? We're going to talk about that at the end of the program. But to start, the news of the day and really the news of the week, the Colonial Pipeline, which transports about 45% of fuel consumed on the East Coast, initiated a restart of pipeline operations on Wednesday evening after a six-day shutdown caused by ransomware hacks. But it will take several days for things to return to normal, with some analysts saying it could even take weeks for gasoline, diesel, and jet fuel to flow through some places and refill nearly empty storage units, given the 5,500-mile pipeline that flows just five miles per hour. Earlier that day, on Wednesday, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg told reporters the administration was working around the clock to tackle delays caused by the shutdown of Colonial Pipeline's operations. Here's what he had to say. What could have been done or what should be done to prevent something like this from happening? Well, uh, this is part of what we have in mind when we talk about resilience. Uh, We need to make sure our infrastructure is resilient to climate security issues caused by the increased frequency and severity of weather events. But we also need to be sure uh, that we are resilient in the face of cyber threats uh, and uh, certainly in, in the kinds of things that the American Jobs Plan will be funding and supporting. With me now to talk about the Biden administration's response to the gas crisis and vulnerability of America's energy infrastructure is U.S. Congressman August Fluger, who represents the 11th Congressional District of Texas. Representative Fluger is also a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the Homeland Security Committee. Congressman, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Well, we are glad to have you. What's your quick reaction uh, to Secretary Buttigieg's comments there about the uh, the moment that we're in? Well, you know, look, I mean, he's right. Resiliency is key. We do need to have resiliency. But I think the other side of the coin right here is that uh, this administration has done everything they possibly can to attack, assault, and cancel the oil and gas industry, which, as you pointed out, this particular pipeline is providing 45% of the fuel needed on the East Coast. So yes, we do need resiliency, uh, but but let's look at the bigger picture and not uh, not miss the fact that the administration doesn't value the energy security and what uh, oil, natural gas, uh, and, and other forms of affordable, reliable energy do for our country, our way of life, and our security. We know that when he was campaigning, he made remarks that that uh, concerned many in the oil industry. And I know your district is heavily represented, or you heavily represent the oil industry and what happens there in Texas. Um, do we think there is a connection between the somewhat flippant remarks he made about the oil industry and what we're experiencing now? Well, I mean, if, if we're talking about the Colonial Pipeline specifically, I think we do need to have a discussion and sitting on the Homeland Security uh, Committee. This is, you know, squarely uh, in, in the jurisdiction of that committee and, and and of the administration to make sure that we protect our infrastructure, critical infrastructure. You know, I spent 20 years in the military as a fighter pilot. We look at critical infrastructure both from an offensive and as a defensive side to protect, and so that's really important uh, for us as a country to look at what keeps us running. We went through this in February in Texas with the winter storms. And we do need resiliency, we need reliability. The renewables are great, and it's gonna take all of the energy we can muster in the next two decades as our population continues to grow. But you have to have reliability 
And that's what oil and natural gas do, which my district, including the Permian Basin, provides for this country and the world. Now, we know that on Wednesday, President Biden also signed an executive order on cybersecurity in response to this crisis. What's your thoughts on that executive order? Is it enough? Is it adequate? What did you think about that? Well, let, let's also, uh, you know, kind of look at the details here. This executive order has been in the works since Solar Winds, and we had some hearings on Solar Winds, the cyber attack that we saw uh, at the end of last year, and have now started to investigate. And so, um, it's a step in the right direction, but it doesn't go far enough, and it really just uh, kind of limits its own jurisdiction to government contractors and um, entities that are that are actually working in the government for information sharing, intelligence sharing. Um, but we have got to to understand as a country what our policy is going to be in the attribution of attacks, whether they're criminal attacks or even domestic terrorism, uh, holding people accountable is going to be so important. And that's what we've been disappointed in this administration is their lack of accountability for actors, state actors like China and Russia and other criminal organizations. At this point, do we have any reason to believe that this is anything other than hackers who are looking for money? Yeah, I think that's the important thing for us to really investigate and to see what happened, uh, what are the details, what are the facts. Uh, we need a full investigation on this and to make sure that we can do everything possible uh, to help our, our private industry, whether it's the oil and gas industry, the pipelines like Colonial uh, or other critical industries to help our private partners uh, protect against this. You sit on the Homeland Security Committee. What conversations are taking place in Congress? Uh, what advice would you give to the Biden administration about what they can do to make sure that things like this don't happen in the future? Well, again, I think step one is let's have the investigation to understand who the actors are, what their goals are, uh, and, and whether or not there's any state support uh, from countries uh, around the world. And then step two, is you know with the Homeland Security Committee and other uh, agencies out there, we do need to do a better job of sharing intelligence, of making sure that those private partners uh, are equipped, that they learn best practices of how to prepare and prevent. You know, in my district, we actually had a company that was hacked into, um, and, and they had employed a, a cyber defense. Uh, they had a cyber defense contract with, with the private company. And we're able to fight it and mitigate it and, and prevent something bad from happening. Um, and I think that's the kind of thing that this administration can do. Um, and we in Congress, obviously, on the Homeland Security Committee can lead the way and will lead the way. People have expressed some concern because of the shortage and the, the hoarding that we have seen on the east coast of gasoline, that this will have an impact on gas prices into the future, even once this, the pipeline issue is taken care of. Do you think that's a real concern? Well, sure. I think as demand continues to go up, coming out of a pandemic, supply right now obviously interrupted um, in, the, in the transmission from the Colonial Pipeline, um, you know, we'll, we'll certainly see a short-term effect and, and potentially even a long-term effect. But, you know, I think even more important um, is this should be a wake-up call uh, for America, for our citizens, for 330 million people who enjoy the best quality of life that the, the world has ever known. Um, and, you know, this is uh, the interruption that we've seen to daily life. Folks that are right here in D.C., those that are in Georgia and the Carolinas and, and all the way up into Virginia, they have felt the effects of this. Right now, there are people who cannot get gasoline. And so, um, yes, the price will continue to go up. But we as a country need to look at this is important and, and, and call on the administration to not do the same thing through policy that a criminal organization was able to do for the short amount of time that they've done it uh, in, in this example. And to that, to that point, it, it's common to say in the political space that you shouldn't let a good crisis go to waste. And this, of course, is a crisis, kind of in, in the same way that in Texas we saw in the winter when the cold weather uh, took down the infrastructure there for the, the power plants there and people were without weather for or were without power for a long time. Is there any concern that this 
moment will be used by the federal government to assert more control over private companies that have a critical role in our transportation infrastructure and our, our energy infrastructure. Is that a concern or do you even think that might be appropriate? Listen, I'm worried about federal overreach every single day. So, yes, I think that there is a chance that that could happen. Um, and obviously, with an example like this and what we're going through in this crisis, we want to make sure uh, that, that we do the right thing. So investigating the facts, getting everything out on the table, having a transparent uh, you know, approach to the way that we react is super important. Yeah. Now, this is a cyber attack of an energy industry deliverer, but are there other industries, in, in your conversations with Homeland Security, are there other industries that could likewise be impacted that should be um, should be taking note of what's happening here and making sure that they, that they are not vulnerable in the way that Colonial clearly was in this case? Well, I think so. And if the pandemic taught us anything, you know, we, we're looking at supply chain issues right now all across the country, whether it's building supplies or whether it's uh, raw materials. And obviously now with the, the Colonial Pipeline, the example that you mentioned, um, but, but even, you know, financial uh, institutions in that industry, I mean, we as a society have a very integrated uh, and advanced economy, a, you know, very complex system. And so an interruption to one part has an effect on the rest of it. And we do need to look at that. Uh, and again, back to what I said previously, mitigate that by having a strong defense, a good partnership uh, between the government and, and the private industry. But let's let the private industry, uh, you know, do what they do best, which is innovate um, and unleash their, uh, you know, the, you know their, uh, their own thoughts and, and the ways that they would mitigate this and provide them a stable platform to do that from. Now, you have introduced uh, some legislation, the Saving America's Energy Future Act, which would prohibit the Biden administration from declaring a moratorium on issuing new oil and gas permits for drilling on federal lands. Now, that predates, of course, this episode. But tell me why you did that and how you think that could be helpful to this situation. Well, it, it kind of goes back to the thought that, you know, this activity, this crime that has happened against Colonial, um, is an outside actor, but we don't want the federal government to introduce market inefficiencies that also hurt the supply chain. And that's exactly what would happen um, if they place a moratorium like they have. Uh, and if that continues uh, to hold out on drilling or leasing or permitting um, to get those products to where they need to go to continue our economic progress. And so, you know, that, that was our thought process was uh, we, we want to continue to do everything we can to provide the energy needs at an affordable uh, and reliable cost to the American public. I mean, I just, I have to continue to say this, that energy security is national security. Um, and when you look at emissions, which is what they uh, always point to, we have done more over the last decade to lower harmful emissions than the Paris Climate Accords could ever do. Uh, and so we're not buying that argument. We know that private industry has done their part to lower those emissions and will continue to do so. And we hope you get a good response from that. Congressman August Pfluger, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your efforts in Congress and serving our country. God bless you and yours. Appreciate you joining us today. Thank you and God bless.